Good morning, noon or night, wherever and whenever you are listening, you are listening to The Shift. I am your host. My name is Doug McKenty. This episode was recorded on September 14th, 2020. Welcome to this special full-length feature episode given to the public in order to facilitate this very important conversation about constitutionality in the wake of the coronavirus lockdowns. Today we welcome guest Clyde Cleveland to the program to discuss the notion that many state governors in the United States are engaging in executive branch overreach, illegally using executive orders under a supposed state of emergency to impose lockdown measures on an unsuspecting public tantamount to house arrest. Clyde represents the Constitutional Law Group, an organization of lawyers, county sheriffs, and concerned citizens standing up for their rights and educating the public about the constitutional boundaries imposed on governments to protect individuals from control by the few and designed to prevent the kind of executive power grabs that many are enduring as a result of a disease which the CDC admits has an infection mortality rate of just 0.26%. It is a sad truth about modern America that many do not understand these freedoms nor truly comprehend the type of dystopian future represented by a world where such freedoms no longer exist. In a heartbeat, many have felt the freedom of assembly, the freedom to worship, and the rights against unreasonable search and seizure dashed to the wind as public gathering is banned and contact tracing imposed without so much as a public discussion, much less an open and transparent legislative debate leading to a vote. These processes, sacrosanct in any free and democratic society, have been ignored while the governors of many states appear to be acting more like dictators than leaders of a free and open society. Clyde Cleveland joins the program today to remind us of the necessity to remain vigilant in the face of those who have no respect for personal boundaries, but would take advantage of any claimed crisis to further their own selfish desires for power and control. Stay tuned as he outlines the constitutional protections which can be used by individuals and communities to prevent this controlling agenda and empower citizens and local leaders with the legal tools to stand up to those who would usurp freedom in order to coalesce power in the hands of the few. The Constitutional Law Group has joined forces with the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association to produce a series of public events to further the cause, presenting the next rally entitled Free America Now in Yuba City, California on Wednesday, September 16th, and featuring such speakers as Sheriff Mack, Dr. Simone Gold, Dr. Sherry Tenpenny, and activist Peggy Hall. Watch the entire event via live stream at www.churchofgladtidings.com and go to www.constitutionallawgroup.us for more information about this and other events planned. I want to thank Clyde Cleveland for coming on the show, and thank you, Clyde, for helping to make the shift. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Extra Shift episode where I am going to have a conversation with Clyde Cleveland uh, about the Constitutional Law Group and some of the actions that are taking place around the country uh, trying to stand up against uh, what's been going on with this COVID-19 lockdown. We're going to have a conversation here about Uh, the Constitution and our constitutional rights uh, and what we might be seeing coming down the pike in terms of some resistance uh, that's starting to grow against what's going on uh, in terms of these lockdowns that have been going on now for so long. Uh, If you've seen the roundtable discussion that I produced last week, uh, we had a conversation with Rocco Galati from Canada uh, and uh, Professor Cahill from Ireland. Uh, and they've been organizing internationally. So it's good to see some pushback happening here in the United States. And I've got Clyde here uh, to let us know what's going on. How are you doing tonight, Clyde? Fantastic. Great. Good to talk to you. Uh, For those of you who don't know, I actually did an interview with uh, Clyde years ago uh, on public radio here in Mendocino County uh, when he was running for the governor of Iowa for the Libertarian Party. So it was just uh, fortuitous that we've been brought back together uh, yeah. to have this conversation now. So do you want to give people a little bit about your history and how you got involved with the Constitutional Law Group and, and what's going on around the country in, in terms of these lockdowns and, and the pushback against it? Yeah, um, you know, right from the beginning when, when this came out, you know, I mean, obviously everyone was concerned about the health of, of loved ones. And, uh, you know, this sounded horrible when it came out and all the... the uh, the projections of how many people were going to die and, and everything was just, you know, really, really scary. And so I think everybody in the country, you know, felt like, wow, this is, this is really important that we, that we listen to the authorities and that we do whatever we can to protect people that are vulnerable and ourselves and, you know, not spread this around. But then after a few weeks, it just became pretty obvious to me that, 
the original projections were way, way out of proportion mm -hmm. to what they really were. And then within, I'd say, a month, it was pretty clear that this was only affecting people that were had really compromised immune systems and people who were young, people who were healthy. Um, if they, they didn't even know they had it in most cases, if they had it, or if they did have it, they got over it quickly. Uh, so anyway, it, it, it just started to not ring true to me uh, more and more. And so the more I looked into it, the more I looked what I, what I saw, I just saw that there was a narrative being created that had more to do with control of people uh, and uh, control of behavior uh, and control of uh, what we do, how we run our economy, than the health issue. Uh, so uh, I just started looking into it deeper and deeper. And when I found things that I thought were uh, pertinent, I would send them out to people. That's kind of how I started. And what happened is, is this, as time went by, it was obvious that these lockdowns and everything else were having more damage. I remember when Dr. Atlas, who's soon, who recently joined Trump's team, came out in March or April. And he said by that time, it was pretty clear to him that the effects of the lockdown were going to be worse. Mm -hmm. In other words, the cure was going to be worse than the disease. And it was obvious to a lot of people. But man, it, it just kept getting pushed. The initial narrative was like they wouldn't let go. And uh, it seemed to me like it was really politically motivated. So anyway, um, we started to really work with other people around the country. We started to have uh, you know Zoom meetings like this. And we, we met the Constitutional Law Group. And I had uh, helped Sheriff Richard Mack create the first Constitutional Sheriff Convention in 2012. I put together a group called Free America Now in 2012. And we got 113 sheriffs to uh, the very first uh, CSPOA, that's Constitutional, Constitutional Sheriff Peace Officer Association uh, in Las Vegas. And with 113 sheriffs, we paid for all their expenses, paid for the room and board, raised the money, got these sheriffs together. It was a fantastic event. And it really was about educating the sheriffs on what their role is to protect the people. Because mm -hmm. that's why we elect a sheriff. The sheriff is elected for the people in the county, and their job is to protect the constitutional rights of the citizens in their county. And they have a lot of authority. The reason Richard Mack is a uh, really well-known name and one of the most uh, influential sheriffs in the country is because he won a lawsuit, a federal lawsuit against the United States government uh, relating to the Brady Bill. Uh, Mac, it was a Mack Prince decision, and they won. 5-4 decision in the Supreme Court. And that decision, in a nutshell, in a real summarized version, what it did is it confirmed the fact that the sheriff is the most, uh, the most powerful law enforcement officer in the county. Within his county, he's the guy. Everything has to go through the sheriff. State police, local police, federal officials, uh, FDA, uh, any, any, uh, any DEA, they all have to go through the sheriff. If the sheriff doesn't like what they're doing, they can't do it in his county or his or her county. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, yeah. we've had such an interesting situation here, and I'm in California, so I can only relate to exactly what's going on here. But I know that situations are similar around the country where, you know, we have this initial lockdown and people are saying, well, we're going to do, we're going to do this for two weeks to flatten the curve. Right. And the flatten the curve to every, you know, the media was just saying, we got to flatten the curve. We've got to do this to slow right. things down. The hospitals are going to get overwhelmed. Right. Yeah. And then it just kept going. And well, then, they, kept then going. they said it was, Oh, the case, <laughs> there's so many cases. Well, right. of course there's more cases because they're testing. Yeah. <laughs> and nobody's, no, nobody's saying, nobody's like, Oh, well think about it. Of course there's more cases. They're, de they're testing more people. Sure. But how many deaths are there? And what they were doing is they were, sh they were giving the cases, the statistics on the cases, but they weren't giving the statistics on the deaths. Right. The cases were going up and the deaths were going down, but they didn't say that. So they pick and choose the, the uh, facts and the figures to make it look worse. This is when you really started to see it's all about creating fear. 
why? Why is why are they doing that? Is it that they want to win the election? They want to make Trump look bad? Is it because they want to sell a vaccine? Uh, is it just because they want to condition us to be like cattle and sheep? I mean, maybe it's all three. Maybe it's more than that. But it's obvious that it's something because it isn't factual. It right. isn't based in fact. And now you've got people like, the, I think one of the turning points in all this was when that those, those doctors like Dr. Simone Gold and Dr. Emmanuel, the Nigerian from Houston, when the, all those doctors got together in D.C. and then they went out and they were meeting together and then they went outside in front of the Supreme Court and they started blowing everybody's minds about what was really going on. And that went viral. There were 18 million hits within three or four hours. And then YouTube took it down. And then that next day, Dr. Simone Gold was fired from her job after right. 27 years. Now, this is a woman who has a Stanford law degree, then went to the University of Chicago Medical School, best law school in the country, one of the best medical schools in the country, worked for 27 years, highly regarded. And she says that tell us the truth about how, about hydroxychloroquine, how well it works, and how the numbers are being exaggerated about how many people actually have died and how many you know deaths have been grown and things like that. She got fired the next day from her a job of 27 years and then she was on Tucker Carlson. But now they have they have messed with the wrong person because she's on fire. So we were very happy to get Dr. Simone Gold to be our featured speaker on our next event. And we've been making creating these events around around the country really focused on the sheriffs helping the people. Mm -hmm. But when we do it, we want people to understand the medical issues so that they understand about masks, they understand about social distance, they understand about vaccines. So this event that we have actually in two days now, it's going to be Wednesday. Um, it's Pacific time. It starts uh, at, at 10, 10 o'clock a.m. Uh, it's going to be in Yuba City, but it's going to be live streamed all over the world for anybody who wants to watch it. We're going to have Dr. Simone Gold. She's our featured speaker. We're going to have Dr. Tenpenny, uh, who is, uh, oh gosh, a triple, certif a triple board certified doctor, 37 years. She's a vaccine expert. Uh, she's amazing. We're going to have her. We're going to have Ty Bollinger from Truth About Cancer and Truth About Vaccines. He'll Great. be on there too. So there's yeah. going to be a ton of really top-notch medical information. There's going to be activists who are fighting back on the masks and uh, people from Orange County that, that uh, have had great success and, you know, being able to have stores be mask free. Uh, and uh, then also the sheriffs, we're going to have four sheriffs as well. Uh, so it's going to be a great event. I hope people will come and watch it and share, uh, share what this is. Now, what you do is you go to constitutionallawgroup.us constitutionallawgroup.us and the flyer for this event is on that website okay and it's glad to, church of glad tidings i believe but it says right on the fly, flyer and what all you have to do to get on is go to the, the the church's website which is on the flyer and click live zoom and you're going to be able to watch the whole thing now we we're going uh, you want to hear the story about how this got together cuz it's kind of interesting oh no, absolutely okay all right so so this is how things have been happening for us. I'm telling you, it's like we feel this forces forces of nature are behind us and within us doing this work like nothing I've ever seen. So um, an associate of mine and I that's in our group, uh, we had been down at the front site uh, place in Nevada uh, doing some shooting on the range. There are a whole group of us. We decided to get together and have an organizational meeting and do some firing on the range and stuff. And uh, we also met with the sheriff of Nye County when we were there too, um, Sheriff Worley. She's going to be speaking at the event. Um, so anyway, we're driving back through through California. We're about an hour away from Yuba City, and we get a call from one of our associates that said that the pastor in Yuba City at the Glad Tidings Church uh, was told by Governor Newsom that he had to shut down his church, mm -hmm. and he had kept his church open because. He, I, I guess he assumed that since Governor Newsom wasn't doing anything to the thousands of people that were gathering together at these 
demonstrations in all of his cities across the state. They weren't saying anything to them about masks or social distancing. He figured he had the right to open his church. Well, Governor Newsom didn't agree with that. He wanted him to close his church. So the pastor came back and said, I'm not going to close my church. Governor Newsom came back and said, we're going to put you in jail. Sheriff Brendan Barnes stepped in and told Governor Newsom, no way, you're not going to put our pastor in jail. Right. You know, we're not going to enforce your edicts. And because they're against our rights, they're, they're, they go, uh, these ed- edicts, first of all, there was no law passed. The legislation, the legislature of California didn't meet and pass a law that people couldn't go to church. And that's that was a, an edict by the governor. Right. I mean, this is what I want to get into. Like literally okay. all of this that people don't understand right. is that at least in California, but, but true uh, of much of the country, depending on what state you're in, California may be one of the most egregious in terms of this, but this is an executive order. The guy just yeah. decided he will felt like doing this one day. And now yeah, it's for lockdown. You, and you, it's, can't, you, can't, uh, you can't get rid of rights that are in the Bill of Rights with um, an executive order or a lockdown or emergency situation. You just can't do it. Right. You, you can try to do it. And if people go <laughs> along with it, you know, and people just follow. But well, if you know your rights, you just say, no, nope, I'm not going to do that. But the sheriff really, that's where the sheriff comes in. That's his, just it. We here in Mendocino County, we had one restaurant that decided to stay open. They said, what the hell, you know? <laughs> Right. Why Why do we have to shut down? They stayed open. And all of a sudden, everybody in the county, and at the time, I mean, this was a few months ago, so there was still, right. I think at this point, people are really starting to question because, I mean, right. sure, there are some positive cases, but there's not a lot of hospitalizations going on, and the deaths are, are down, you know, very low. Uh, and people are wondering why these lockdowns are still going on. A few months ago, you know, there was a lot more uh, of a debate we were having right in the middle of the big mass debate, and this restaurant decides to stay open. And all of a sudden, everyone realized that there was no enforcement mechanism for any of this. Uh, right. There was zero enforcement mechanism going on. And the Board of Supervisors actually, at that time, got together and voted to go ahead and find this guy and create an enforcement mechanism here on the county level, and then the county sheriff decided to go ahead and enforce it. But it was almost a a shock to everybody in the community here that like, wait a minute, you know, there's actually no force of law behind any of this. The the governor just said, hey, we're doing this. And everybody just started to do it, you know? Exactly. Exactly. It's crazy. These executive uh, orders are not supposed to go. They're they're not well, supposed to go longer than sixty days. And then right. and then they ne- he needs to have a legislative requirement here. They they need to pass laws saying that all of this is okay. But there's been no public debate, and no. and no democratic process to any of this. It's, uh, and it's even the even the sixty day executive order is not lawful. Mm-hmm. It it may be legal, but it's not lawful. Sure, and, and nobody understands what that means. They. People pass, you know, governments pass laws all the time that are not not lawful. They're, they passed it so they can call it legal, but it's not lawful. And that's what the Bill of Rights and the Constitution is all about. It's mm-hmm. to protect us from unlawful, illegal laws. And the sheriff, that's what the sheriff, that's why the sheriff has to know the Constitution. And that's what we do. You know, we, what we do is we try to get the sheriffs to be educated on this. Um, and uh, the CSPOA, that's what their mission is right now in uh, Virginia. Uh, the Virginia sheriffs are having an event on the 29th of September for mm-hmm. all the Virginia sheriffs. And then the day after, they're asking all the sheriffs to stay for a whole day long session with Sheriff Richard Mack. I'm going to be at that event uh, with Sheriff Mack. Uh, and we're inviting sheriffs from around the country to come to that day, that second day. Uh, with Sheriff Mack. And I think we're going to have a couple hundred sheriffs there. Uh, So that's that's another one we're doing after this event on Wednesday. So we're just going to keep on it. Um, We're also announcing that we're going to have a sheriff liaison meeting uh, that we're going to announce on Wednesday. And and that's going to be a weekly meeting with sheriffs from around the country so they can see what each other is doing around the country and support each other and help and learn from each other about what's happening in different counties. So that's going to be our focus now, because right now we think 
and the other focus there is having people in the county get behind their sheriff. It's if if, if the sheriff doesn't feel this, he's got support from the people, mm-hmm. and they're remember they're elected. Okay, so if they think you know that protecting people's rights is going to get them fired, you know they're not going to be getting elected. Then you know they're going to think twice about doing the right thing. So this is why the people need to you know create assemblies, create associations within their county to support the sheriff mm-hmm. and let the sheriff know that they got their back. We have, and again, just to go through the process that we've been going in my community here, um, just recently, the Board of Supervisors actually sent a a letter to the governor asking, because they're, you know, they see no scientific evidence. I mean, from their point of view, and I think this is the evidence that they're seeing in the county is that, sure, uh, I guess most of the cases here are coming from you know, kind of like large gatherings or parties where people aren't wearing masks or social distancing, but they're not coming from, uh, there's just no evidence that they're coming from any of these main street businesses that are being shut down. Mm -hmm. And so they asked the state, uh, if, um, you know, they could go ahead and open up these businesses because there's no evidence that the, the COVID is actually getting, you know, spread through uh, these small businesses, uh, and they get, they get no response essentially. Well, and they don't need to ask the state. They should just open. That's exactly, I mean, that's what, uh, why I'm having this conversation with you and I'm hoping to get this uh, interview in front of the, in front of our County Sheriff and some of our supervisors to let them know that they really, you, you know, they're trying to figure out a process here. And it's like, I think the process is to just go about your business, you know, do, do the sheriff can enforce what he wants to enforce. Anybody and, and, listening to this should ask their sheriff, Sheriff, go to your sheriff, go with several people and just say, you know, first of all, we really appreciate what you're doing. We really want you to watch this event on Wednesday. There's mm-hmm. going to be four sheriffs there explaining what's going on and what what they really should be doing with this whole thing and experts. Um, it's going to be an amazing event. Uh, we've got, you know, all the best people that we could possibly have. Brendan Barnes, Sheriff Brendan Barnes who protected the pastor in Yuba, 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 um, Yuba City. Uh, he will be there. The pastor will be there. Uh, that Brendan Barden saved from having to go to jail uh, is going to be speaking there. Um, and several other sheriffs that have already shown that they will protect their citizens from these lockdowns. You know, I met with a doctor the other night when we were in Las Vegas uh, who's he's about 76, 77 years old. He's been a doctor since he was 28. Um, and he said that the projection for suicides this year, because of the lockdowns, mm-hmm. loss of jobs, uh, and this craziness, uh, is estimated to be over 100,000, which yeah. is way more than the amount of actual COVID deaths. He also said that he feels that the COVID deaths are actually, and he knows, he's a doctor, he's in the hospital, he knows what's going on. These COVID deaths are way, way over, 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 uh, they're, they're being, they're just being faked. And the reason they're being faked is because the hospitals get paid for COVID deaths. Right. They get yeah. paid more if they go on a respirator. So, and it depends on the state, how much they're getting, but it's a lot of money. Right. And I've heard, I understand that the state governments also get funding from the federal government based on on how many cases they get. So there's all this financial incentive to to maximize the number of COVID cases that you're getting in. And of course, I mean, just by the law of supply and demand, they're going to figure out if they've got a financial incentive here, both on the state government level and on the hospital level. To come yeah. up with COVID cases, that by God, they're going to come up with some COVID cases. Yeah, I think they have the number of COVID deaths somewhere in this country now around 180,000 or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, this doctor said it is probably at the most 25 to 40,000, at the very most. And most of those people, again, are people that have died um, because they were their immune systems were extremely weak and they're old. And so they're very susceptible. This flu is very bad for people who have have uh, weakened immune systems. Mm-hmm. But for young people, children, children just don't get 
if they do get it, they don't even know they have it. And most people who are healthy up until their 60s or 70s, they're not going to have a problem with this. And hydroxychloroquine works. It's proven to work all over the world. Right. And that, they just don't want to hear that. Yeah, the, the, the misinformation people. about how deadly this thing is and yeah. the misinformation about the treatments, right. there's ivermectin, right. there's intravenous right. vitamin C. I've seen doctors saying that a nebulized hydrogen peroxide works miracles for people. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of treatments. But again, yep. what my understanding is that if there is a treatment, if there's a treatment that's working, mm-hmm. then they can't, uh, they can't fast track the vaccine. The, the vaccine is based on the emergency use statutes. And so yeah. if there's a, if they, yeah. if they allow a treatment protocol to actually work, they can't fast track the vaccine anymore. So. And why do they want vaccines? Because they have no liability for vaccines. Right. The federal government picks up any liability. But if anybody gets hurt by a vaccine, the pharmaceutical industries are totally off the hook. So what does that mean? Their profit margin on vaccines is many, many, many times higher than any other drug they sell. They want to sell vaccines. That's yeah. that's it. It's the profitability. Bill Gates said, you know, I've, I've invested $2 billion in vaccines. I expect a 20 to 1 return. Right. Yeah, I'd like to have a 20 to 1 return on all my investments, too. <laughs> um, but uh, that's that's it, man. It's, it's, uh, so he's pushing them all over the world. Um, you know, any, anyway, that's it's, it's obvious a lot of money. It's political. There's no question about that. There's mm-hmm. a political motivation here to keep this thing going. Um, but, uh, you know, nobody wants to admit that, um, you know, that on the, uh, the other side, I guess I'll say. But uh, anyway, I think that people need to start looking for truth in this whole thing. I really do. Uh, and if people from whatever your political persuasion is, just watch this event on Wednesday, because these are uh, Dr. Tenpenny and, and Dr. Gold are there. They don't, it doesn't get any higher in terms of the hierarchy of medical doctor knowledge and credibility than those two. Uh, so, so please listen in on that. Uh, educate your sheriff, support your sheriff. Get your sheriff educated and have them, have them listen. By the way, all these videos of, of each speaker will be online. Okay, they'll be on BitChute and they'll be on YouTube. And the reason we do BitChute is because BitChute doesn't censor. Um, you know, YouTube has, has censored so many things, um, and uh, we don't we don't want to deal with that. So we're going to use BitChute, and people will be able to watch these videos. Send them out. Send the links out to their friends and their relatives and. Uh, it's really, really important. We got to we got to start dealing with this situation the right way and get our economy going again. Because having the economy shut down like this is killing people. Right. No question about it. Yeah, I mean, we just heard uh, the CDC actually had to come out last week and tell people they're not allowed to evict the thirty to forty million people that are apparently about to be homeless as a result of this. I mean, this is. Yeah. Like you're talking about, the collateral damage is overwhelming. I mean, we've got the suicides, we've got the addiction issues, mm-hmm. um, you know, and we've got the people who are out of work and the homeless issue that is just skyrocketing. And the government is having to backpedal to, to, to cover up the, all the damage that they've done. The thing um, about government is they never want to admit they were wrong. Right. They never <laughs> admitted we were wrong about Vietnam. We never admitted sure. we were wrong about Iraq. You know, it's just, it, they just don't want to ever admit they're wrong. And, um, you know, that's, that's the problem here because they were wrong. All their, their numbers were wrong from the beginning. The only right. thing that they were right about is when they originally said that the masks are worthless. Right. <laughs> they were right. God darn, they got that right. <laughs> then they got it wrong. <laughs> and once they went with that one, they just kicked on it. But, you know, the same doctor I was talking to, he said, those masks, it's just like trying to stop a, vi- trying to stop a virus with a mask is like trying to stop a mosquito with a cyclone fence. Right. You know, it just, it doesn't work. Um, and people are having all kinds of problems. Oh, my friend's a periodontist. He's... He can't keep up with the surgeries because mm. this mouth thing is happening. When people are wearing that mask all day, it's affecting their teeth. And their sure. teeth are literally starting to fall out. Huh. They have all kinds of problems. So, I've been hearing about staph infections and other problems, rashes, oh yeah. people breaking yeah. out in rashes. Yeah. 
Yeah. We were not designed as human beings to wear a mask over mouth. That that carbon dioxide dioxide is supposed <laughs> to go out, not back in. You know, it's just it's nuts. Well, and you know, the bottom line is it, it needs to be an individual choice. I mean, this is a this is a yeah. situation about Absolutely. informed consent. We could talk about the Nuremberg Code. I mean, these these they call them non pharmaceutical interventions, but they're still medical interventions, and people need to have uh, healthcare freedom of choice here to be able to say, hey. You know, I I've looked at the information and I choose not to you to you know engage in this in this medical you know, in, but, intervention. But, <laughs> it's it's a human right. I'm just going to say this, but you know, I'm I was a member of the Socialist Party when I was 20 years old, so mm-hmm. I've been I've been on the left, and the Vietnam War just radicalized me big time uh, in that direction, but. You know, liberal, the two states that are the most liberal are the two states that have mandatory vaccine. California and New York. That's what is that about? That's not liberal. That's fascist. Well, and this this is amazing to me. And I did want to touch on this while I have you here. And I know we kind of are doing this late and we wanted to, to get this out to promote the event. But um, if I can keep you for just a few more minutes, because this idea of of individual rights and freedoms, I mean, I was promoting this uh, conversation on Facebook, actually, on a, on a local Facebook page. And people want to turn it into a left right issue where I'm just like. I think we all agree that democracy is better than dictatorship, right? It's a, why are we having this conversation? And they they wanted to say, well, you know, you must be some kind of conservative person because you're concerned about human rights. Right. And and this is the thing that for for whatever reason, it seems like more and more over the last twenty or thirty years, the progressive left has come to just not see the importance of living in a society that's based on freedom of choice. And they seem more and more to just believe that what the government says is, is the correct course of action. And everybody just needs to follow what the government says, regardless of, of their personal beliefs and without any respect for, for these kinds of boundaries. I mean, the reason why they, we have the bill of rights in the first place is to make sure that like, Hey, you know, here's where my freedom begins and the government's power ends and here's my personal boundary between what you, you can tell me to do and it's, it's like it's people don't have respect itself. for that anymore uh, i just don't i think it's because it's not taught anymore i mean literally it's not taught yeah. at all in schools anymore but you know it's a different philosophy that's being taught unfortunately and uh you know that's something the reason you know one of the reasons i've been really strong on all this is because i started a constitutional study class through the National Center of Constitutional Studies in, in Fairfield, Iowa in 1990. And as a result of that, you know, it led to all kinds of things for me. I mean, I ended up running for office. Mm-hmm. I ended up doing the sheriff's convention. You know, I'm doing the work I'm doing now because I realize how important those rights are for my grandchildren. I have seven grandchildren. I don't want to see them grow up in a, in a uh, socialist dictatorship, you know? Right. One, one of the people in our group, is from the Czech Republic. Uh, Lenka is her name. She's from Orange County. And she grew up under uh, communist, communism. Her parents grew up under fascists. And so for her to see the country she's moved to because she wanted to be free, go in this direction of uh, dictatorship and, uh, and government uh, lockdowns and government mm-hmm. fascism really is what this is like. Um, but it really, and it's corporatism is what it really is. I mean, right. pharmaceutical companies, it's, you know, what Eisenhower um, warned us about, the military industrial congressional complex. Um, most people leave congressional out because he didn't say that, but it was in his speech and they begged him not to say it. Military industrial congressional complex. We have a pharmaceutical medical industrial complex, mm-hmm. congressional complex now. Um, You know, so we have an energy, we have the energy companies, we have all these, we have the criminal justice system incarceration, uh, you know, in uh, industrial complex as well. Right. Uh, And that's a really bad one because we have more people in prison, higher percentage than any other country in the planet. There's all these things where corporatism really, we've allowed the corporations to run this country. Um, And we got to stop that. Right. We shouldn't, we shouldn't allow corporations 
any ability to participate in the democratic process at all. It should just be individuals. Just yeah. individuals. And that's just what's so frustrating is that people don't seem to understand that the corporate influence, I, I think, especially many on the left feel like the more government is the solution to the corporate influence when, in fact, I mean, clearly you can see that it's all government corporate collusion that's causing the problems. If you, want the, you want a stronger government, hey, the, the, you got to realize that the government's controlled by the corporations. Right. So you're giving the corporations more power. Yeah, you got to cut that cord between the two. And the way this country was originally developed, they did not have lifetime life. A corporate wasn't, uh, you know, it, it didn't last for an infinite amount of time. It lasted for five or ten years. Right. The charters and were then, limited. The states chartered the corporations for five or ten years, and then they would evaluate them. And if they had, if they weren't being good citizens as a corporation, then they lost their charter. They were done. They were out of business. And what happened is the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Carnegies, during the 1800s, they bought Supreme Court justice. Mm -hmm. That's what they did. And the Supreme Court justice, if you look at the one, all these decisions throughout the 1800s, just gave corporations more and more and more power. To this day, they have more, they have all the power of, of an individual. And in life, they have more power than an individual. Right. They don't away, they're getting away with murder. Literally. More money than some countries, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. And all these, all these regulatory agencies like the CDC and FDA, they're a joke. They're run by those corporations. They own right. them. They captured them. Um, you know, so it's uh, that's really when you really get down to it, whether you're a liberal, a libertarian, or a Republican, or a conservative, whatever you want to call yourself, the biggest problem in this country is corporatism. Right. And that's where I think we need to just unite behind this understanding. I mean, it's clear to see what's going on. And I did this interview, I wanted to bring this up with uh, a Dr. Merrill Nass a few weeks back, and she described um, this other branch of, of the of the uh, military industrial complex that she's calling the, the bio defense corporate complex now um, because, and, and this is where then these people have amassed so much money. It includes the pharmaceutical companies, but it's uh, it's the vaccine manufacturers and then all of the bio defense weaponry. So they're weapons manufacturers and vaccine manufacturers. The, the company that uh, manufactures the anthrax vaccine, for example, is deep into this. And these people are all making hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars off the COVID crisis right now. And it's, it's, it's just a part of this big corporatist package, just like you're talking about, that's the driving force behind this entire situation. And people don't seem to understand that they can literally, they have the power to manufacture an event or at least take a crisis that's not Right. nearly as bad as, as it actually in reality is and blow it up into something that that scares the crap out of everybody and then uh you know causes them to suddenly give trillions of dollars to these these corporations and it's a huge money grab right now that's yeah. going on you know the, you 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 interviewed me uh like 18 years ago or whatever it was and, and at that time my partner ed noise and i who ran for attorney general of iowa and i was running for governor we wrote the book, Restoring the Heart of America. And one of the big things that we, we cover in that book is uh, the, the, the reforms that are needed to stop in corporatism. In, mm. in the country. So I would like to just, if you don't mind, let people know about my website, commonsenserevisited.com. And if you go to commonsenserevisited.com, then you will be able to download the PDF of Common Sense Revisited, which is a pamphlet I wrote in 2008. And you can download the PDF of Restoring the Heart of America and go to the chapters on corporate, re corporate reform uh, and election reform. Uh, and we, we deal with all that, too. Mm -hmm. By the way, we're both, Ed and I are both environmentalists. I was called the Green, liber the green Libertarian when I was running for governor. And uh, we have all the, the solutions in there that could really make a difference with the environment that are not top-down solutions from government. You know, I love one of Robert F. Kennedy's uh, great quotes. And, and, you know, he's been an environmental defense lawyer forever. He said, the biggest polluter by far in the United States of America 
is the federal government. So we think that the EPA and the federal, the, all these organizations in the federal government are going to protect us from pollution when the federal government is the biggest polluter. Right. And the federal government has complete sovereign immunity to any damage. Anybody in the government that does anything to the environment, any damage, they are immune. They have sovereign immunity. They can't, they, they are not liable. And guess what that also includes? Any corporation that is in partnership with the government, that sovereign immunity goes to that corporation as well. That all that sovereign immunity thing, that's got to go. If people right. damage the environment, they have to be liable. And it, wh- whoever it is, whether it's if people in the government or people in a corporation, if right. they screw up, they have to be liable. Otherwise, you have no accountability. You know, so anyway, um, commonsenserevisited.com, Restoring the Art of America, it's all on the Common Sense Revisited website. And uh, I think you'll you'll enjoy what you see there. Yeah, I hope people check it out. I mean, it's uh, it's really a worthy cause to be educating people uh, mm-hmm. about these concepts that, um, you know, they, they've gotten such a bad rap and people don't understand how important it is. It's I mean, w- you know, what we're seeing with these governors and, and the power grab using this crisis. And I think we've heard the uh, that phrase before, never let a good crisis go to waste. Oh, yeah. They have this pandemic coming down the line. They're like, sweet, we got a crisis. We'll call a state of emergency. We can centralize power in the hands of these few people. And these few people are in in control, in cahoots with these corporatist forces. And they're just now funneling government money into these corporations. The corporate media, I blame them entirely. Uh, They're supposed to work as as a fourth estate to uh as a check and balance against these kinds of power grabs and instead they just go right along with the narrative to allow it to happen yeah and and, you know we're watching a corporate takeover here and that's exactly why in my opinion they're closing down main street they're closing down main street with the lockdowns while the big corporations are making bank it's not much different than what happened in communist russia when when the bolsheviks took over what did they go after they went after the middle class. They went after the shop owners, the business owners. That's who they went after. That's who they tried to wipe out and make all those people poor. And so they'd be dependent on the government. That's what China did. That's what Mao did. Mm-hmm. They got. They, I was just reading a book about that, all the different things that they put in just to crush the businessmen. All the, they don't want those people rising up. They want those people down. They right. want them down. And so that's what's happening here. It's really, really sad to see. So people better wake up. Better wake up quick. You know, this has been a great interview. Let's remind everybody about Wednesday. But I'd love to do another one with you, Doug, on uh, non-coercive government. Mm-hmm. Because we're getting starting to get into that area. Yeah, and, absolutely. And I've really, that's what I've been, the, a lot of the writing I've been doing and uh, and and uh, videos I've been doing is about non-coercive government. And we can we need a new model, basically. And there are models out there that work. And and uh, I'd love to do a, one, uh, a, one of those with you. Uh, yeah, let's do it. And, so. and we can have you on as uh, one of the roundtable discussions, too, with another. We, we've been trying to get Sheriff Mack on, actually. And, oh, uh, yeah. So okay. we, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll do that. We'll keep working with you guys because it's great to see. Um, I did have one other point to make just to finish this off, which is that, um, and what was it now? <laughs> it was on the tip of my tongue. Just about, oh, the, the corporate takeover and then, um, oh, the way that it's been done psychologically because they're not even using violent force. And this is, I just want to drive this home at the end here that um, it, this is a psychological operation. People are scared. The governors make these executive orders, but they are not backed by the force of law. There's no legislative uh, impact and there's no enforcement mechanism here. So it's just in people's minds that they have to follow and they're doing it. And what you're telling me is that the sheriffs can literally just say, hey, we're not going to do this. We don't need to do this. And and that's the solution. 
Absolutely. It's so <laughs> simple that it's hard to, you know, it's hard for people to understand. <laughs> like if your sheriff doesn't enforce it, it doesn't exist. Let's just go back to our lives, you know? <laughs> exactly. Your sheriff, right. the sheriffs, if they would, if they would really understand what their role is and what their power is as a sheriff, they could shut this whole thing down, shut down the lockdown. Right. You know, uh, in one day, you know, one week. Yeah, it it's all- it's oh. pretty amazing. And I hope that I hope that uh, the county officials and county sheriffs hear this interview and that they check out what's going on with the constitutional law group. And uh, and they start checking out what's happening at these rallies, and hopefully they'll catch this uh, on Wednesday. Do you want to give people that information yeah, again? How to watch that? Go to constitutional law group, constitutional law group dot us. Look at the flyer there, and uh, and you can download that flyer and send it to your friends. And it's going to be Wednesday morning. It starts at ten o'clock a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, and so, you know, get your friends together, watch it together with other people, but it'll be live streamed all day long. And, uh, it's going to be a great event and there's going to be, uh, the, the pastor and the sheriff think that there's going to be four or 500 people in the audience live there. Uh, so it's going to be a right. rock crowd and, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of energy and people are just going to, it's got a big truth bomb is what it is. So uh, we're we're really excited about it. And we literally put it together in seven days. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. It was, I was just wondering, like I said, I was wondering uh, where the movement was going to come from here in the United States. And and then I ran into you guys. So uh, really, I'm so glad you did. You know, that's great. Say hello to your wife for me. You know, we, I knew her. She was a little girl. For sure. Yeah. What a, it's a small world, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. It's amazing. It's amazing. All right. Take care, Doug. Thank All right. You, you so too. Much. You bet. Right. You bet. Yeah. Thanks, Clyde. Right. Take it easy. All right. And hey, everybody, and thanks for listening to this uh, extra edition of The Shift. I'm happy to put out this episode. I'm trying to help uh, promote some of these um, rallies that are starting to happen, some of the pushback happening against the lockdowns. Uh, these uh, lockdowns, uh, by a lot of people's interpretation, are totally unconstitutional. Uh, it's really dangerous, I think, to see these uh, governors uh, across the country just pulling uh, executive order in a state of emergency to take such total control over our lives and our economies without even going through the process, the democratic process of asking the legislature to pass, uh, uh, you know, an, an okay to have a public debate and have the legislature agree uh, to go through uh, this entire process of lockdown um, without even, you know, on the floor of the houses and the uh, senates in these various uh, states being able to discuss opinions openly about exactly how dangerous this uh, virus is uh, and exactly the kind of damage that we're willing to do to the Main Street economy, to people's lives, uh, to their livelihoods, um, because of, uh, you know, potential disease, uh, spreading that uh, science is saying is, uh, really not that much more deadly than, uh, a regular flu season. So, um, you know, without having these public debates and just allowing a handful, uh, of individuals in powerful positions to be able to make these choices, I think it's a really dangerous precedent to set. So it was great to talk to Clyde tonight. Uh, to talk about some of the pushback and to really come to that realization that we're all following along with this, even though there's absolutely no enforcement mechanism, even though uh, it's our county and local governments that make the decisions on uh, how we should follow these or whether we should follow these things or not. Uh, A governor cannot just say, hey, let's shut everything down and then everything gets shut down without people having some freedoms to be able to say our community feels differently. We want to, we want to do something in our own way. Uh, and to discover that with no real enforcement mechanism, a lot of this is just psychological. People are following because the government says so. Uh, where to find out that the local communities and the local county sheriffs really can choose how they want to deal with uh, the presence of the coronavirus in their own way 
and the sheriffs can decide to enforce uh, what they want to enforce in order to protect the people of the community. So uh, believe it or not, we all have a choice here. And I really want to thank Clyde Cleveland for his work to come out and let people know uh, that the county sheriffs do have this, uh, this ability. And uh, so these conversations need to be taking place on a local level, and each community really should be making choices for themselves uh, as to how they want to deal with this and not feel obligated just because somebody at the top of the hierarchy says, you got to do it my way. Well, we don't have to do it your way. You know, we can do it our own way. Uh, so, you know, let's take this to heart and let's ask members of our community how we feel about the coronavirus and what we want to do about it, and then go collectively to our local sheriffs and say, hey, Here's what we want to do to protect ourselves, and this is what we're asking you to enforce. And they have the power to do that. So this is really good information to know. Uh, and again, thanks to, to Clyde Cleveland uh, and the people at the Constitutional Law Group for spreading this information and letting people know about it. So I just want to give out that information one more time. First of all, we have this uh, event happening in Yuba City, California, uh, on Wednesday, the 16th of September, starting at 10 a.m. It's going to be live streamed. If you go to the churchofgladtidings.com, you'll be able to catch the live stream there. Also, if you want to find out more about the event or other events happening around the country, you can go to constitutionallawgroup.us. And if you want to find out more about Clyde's work, uh, he's got, and I did do that interview with him about 10 years ago, I think, uh, about Common Sense Revisited. He's got uh, this pamphlet uh, as well as the book that he was talking about uh, posted at commonsenserevisited.com. So you can check out uh, more about Clyde's personal work there. Uh, again, constitutionallawgroup.us uh, for more information uh, about these rallies and about uh, what you can do to talk to your local sheriffs about uh, the actual enforcement mechanism for these lockdowns. If you're feeling like things have gone overboard, then you can have a community conversation, bring it up with your local sheriff, and you all decide together what you want to do going forward. So thank you so much for listening. You can catch uh, all of my stuff on Facebook and YouTube at The Shift with Doug McKenty. I am on Twitter at D McKenty, uh, and I'm also on the web at www.theshiftnow.com. So... Uh, thanks again, and uh, I hope you all have a great day, and uh, we'll keep things moving forward here. All right, take care. <laughs>